Philly's biggest issue. Philly's biggest issue is New York and DC. Now, I think personal was like, because we're sandwiched, it's like 90 minutes if you're riding the Metro or Amtrak, 90 minutes to get into the city. When I say the city, I mean Manhattan and 90 minutes to go to DC. So it, our issue has always been people really look at Philly and say, okay, Liberty Bell and Rocky, that's it. I can see that in a half hour. So the tourism, our, our tourism uh, agency has always been, a, not my tourism, but the, comp, the, the, the city itself, it's always been about helping to distinguish ourselves from those two metropolises, which probably imagine is very, very difficult. So we've had a number of campaigns over the years. And going on as Felipe here, we're doing another Let's Talk Tourism podcast. Right now I'm here with Keshler. He is a business owner of uh, Le Card, Le Carnard. It's a tourism agency located in uh, Philadelphia. And we're gonna have a short chat to see uh, his perspectives on tourism, a little bit about his background and a few uh, tips of advice. So, uh, Keshler, it's a pleasure, a pleasure to have you, man, and uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate this. Thank you for being so patient with me. No, no worries, man, no worries. I, I understand, like, uh, complications happen, and uh, finally, we have, the time is here, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, thank you. Thank you for this Yeah, so let's, uh, let's begin by uh, talking a little bit about yourself. Like uh, a little bit about your backstory and um, how is it that you're here right now doing uh, tourism? How I got here, uh, I always say it's quite a boring story. So I won't be upset if you fall asleep half part way through. All right. Uh, I needed a change of pace. I was working in advertising and marketing for some years and it just did not suit me at all. So I just needed something different. I was stressed all the time and I realized travel was a good release for me. But most importantly, not just travel, but the learning of different cultures, learning their histories, their people, actually interacting and having like real, real experiences. And over time, it just started to like build up in me. It's like when I hear about other people's travel, maybe they go, they go jet ski, they go on a food tour and that was it. But they weren't really learning more about the culture. And for me, learning about that culture connects us, brings us together just a little bit. If I know about the politics, you know, just an overview, doesn't have to be a deep dive. If I know more about that, if I know more about the culture than just the superficial, it brings us both not only closer together, but I have some empathy. I understand the culture a little bit more and I pay it, hopefully pay attention to it as well. So as that thought process started going through me, through my mind over and over again, I started thinking about school as when's. When I was in school, I loved history. I learned, I love learning about the different empires, about the different countries. And I said, you know what? Maybe I should put it all together. So I created the Le Canard out of this goal of I can hopefully steer people in the direction of learning people, learning about different cultures, about people, not just, hey, I'm at the hotel, I met this nice person at the hotel and everyone treats me great. And they're my friends and like posting it. It's just like, hey, I met this person, they're, they're a salesman, you know, great guy, we interacted and I heard that about that person's experience and I know a little bit more. So often when I make an itinerary for a client, I get, let me side note, I get two different types of clients. I get the one that I know where I want to go. I'm an experienced traveler and I want to go here, A, B, C. And it's like, that's great. But then I also get the client that's more, you know what? I really don't know where I want to go. You know, I, I want to go there. So with them, I'm, I have a, a bit more malleability. I can kind of say, okay, you should go visit this town. Most people don't go there. And in this town, you should visit this person or this restaurant. And you can get to know people. So in that way, I am actually influencing your trip just a little bit that I can get them to interact, have real interactions, get them to hopefully visit a business that needs a little bit of help or, you know, would appreciate some spotlight on them. And thus, they're learning a little bit more. So I know I'm a little bit long-winded at times, but the whole goal of Le Canard is to simply introduce people to places, people, cultures that they normally would not run into. So that's it in a nutshell. Learning. Okay, by. That's, that's, no, that's, that's pretty good, man. That's pretty good. Um, so you said uh, you do that uh, worldwide, but you were um, yes. um, um, born and raised in, in Philadelphia or? or? Uh, born and raised in Philadelphia, but I did move away and live in okay. some other <coughs> places for a time. And that also, that that 
goes into the learning about culture because it's influenced my life. I have like uh, God children that live in Australia. I lived in Australia for a time, South Australia, Adelaide. Mm-hmm. I lived there for a time. So I'm connected there. I have friends in New Zealand that I met not only in Philadelphia, but in New Zealand. I have like friends that have now become family that live in Chile, you know, like um, God, God kids in like Chile, they text me all the time telling me about school and about boys. And I say, don't worry about boys. They're stupid right now. Wait till you get older, then they'll get smarter. You know, and I have like some, like I call it like, um, uh, mi otra padre in España, in Madrid. So we go back and forth and he's always checking on me, making sure I eat enough. And I was like, yes, I'm fat. I've eaten enough. So it's like, I have all these connections with people all throughout the world and it's 24 seven. It's to the point where it's like, it's seamless. I don't even hear, I don't even see that they're in a different country. They simply, this is a connection. This is, this, this is, this is, this is a family. When I say connection, I mean like their family, their friends. The only thing that keeps us separated is a time difference and different and, 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 and uh, distance from point A where I am currently in Philadelphia to wherever they are in the world. And I want other people to have that as well. Not just like I said earlier, Okay, I met someone nice at the rest at the hotel. The, the bellhop is really nice. He's a good boy. I gave him twenty dollars. No, it's like I know this person, Maurice or Marie or whomever it may be. I know that person. I'm hopefully keeping in contact with pers- that person, and I'm learning more about the culture via this person. So, like, like I said, it's all about connections, you know, and making the world just a little bit smaller by making those connections readily apparent to everyone. That's interesting. Sorry, one again. I said yeah. I'm long winded. No, no I worries, go. no worries. That's that's the fun of it, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I'm curious, I'm more curious now, you know, I'm more curious. Um, so I, I thought I'd look, look at that. Maybe I didn't ask the correct questions before, but so you only have four years as an experience uh, in the tourism industry, right? Tourism, you didn't study tourism, you have nothing. Uh, four to do years, with but I like a, a bit of cheat code. I've always been involved with history and culture. After I left the industry, it took a, a while like for me to eventually end up in the travel industry. But after I left uh, advertising and marketing, I became a historian. So I started studying that. So it slowly started to grow from there because as a historian, I started learning about museums and places that people weren't visiting and they needed to help. They, did, they needed more people to know about them. To know, m- to know more about them would bring more revenue to them. And I'm more of the person that says, you know what? I just don't want to talk about it. I want to do something about it. So in that case, I became more of a, okay, hey guys, I can use my writing to get people from them in this direction. Like, hey, there, w- one of my first pieces was about a slavery museum in Philadelphia and it's privately owned by the family and they get no funding, no nothing. The topic is a very uncomfortable topic for a lot of people. So it was, okay, now I can write, but now as a tour guide on the back end, now I can bring people there. So when I offer tours like, hey, let me bring you to this museum. You wanna learn about the Underground Railroad? Let me take you to this museum. Now I'm helping them out in that way. So it's like the one-two punch. Yes, knowing more, helps me as far as I can like transfer that knowledge to other people and get them get them ready for it. But being a tour guide and vice versa, being a travel agent helps me get them to the door. So so let me uh, ask you another question. Um, sure. You I, said, I see uh, the gear turning your mind. You're like, mm, oh, what else am I going to No, no. The thing is that you, you do tours inside Philly, but you also do tours to all over the world, right? You do you all over the world. Packages uh, to, uh, South I, Africa, I, South America, to you told yeah. me other places as well, right? You just yeah. don't stay. You don't stay in Philly. You do other. It's, it's mostly people that want to leave this area. I have been very, very fortunate. I've been allowed the opportunity to visit a lot of countries, and I, I lean on that heavily. That's why when people ask me, they often call and they're asking for advice. I can break it down and say, okay, you know, this is what you'll see. This is how you experience them. And being a travel agent means I'm always in the know of what's going on. And I'm always on reading the paper and learning about things about, and so it keeps me up to date on everything. And being in the travel industry as well, they constantly send you information about, this is new about the tourism. This is what we're, what's next, is it? So I'm always getting information. I have another laptop right here and a computer right behind it and a tablet and it's just constant information coming in 24 7 so i'm always being up to kept up to date to everything so when per- person asked me about some yesterday i was asked a question at porto vieta i was like oh yeah i can tell you about this this is what's happening right now mm-hmm. i can i can help you out and i know some people there and you know they'll have a drink ready for you if you drink alcohol to really show you to the country to the culture because as you know most people that visit mexico mexico only go to quintana Uru and Baja California, sir. 
and they rarely go in the middle. So it's like, okay, those places are nice. You've been there? Okay, let's go somewhere else. Let me, let me, let me give you a real experience. Let's go to the center. There's a whole mass of land in the center. Yeah, amazing, huh? What? Let's explore it. And you have to take them to Nayarit as well, huh? <laughs> you have to take them there. Yes, yes, the big <laughs> everyone's talking about Nayarit. It's it's every publication now. I just read it like what, two weeks ago. Everyone's you know talking about there. You got to go new hotels. So I'm curious about exploring it myself. To see what's what it's all about. Hopefully, get the chance. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you, um, um, what what do you see like right now with uh, tourism and uh, the pandemic, the COVID virus? Um, the difference that it is right now compared to two years ago. What is your perspective on uh, that that industry? The you know? only <clears throat> real difference, and I have to say, and this is mainly because the United States, not every country is in the same boat as we are. We have a lot more freedom. The only real difference is that we have more wiggle room. You know, we can go to South America and visit. Yes, there are restrictions, but then yes, I, I, if you're willing to go through the restrictions, you can go there. We can go back and forth. Mexico has always been pretty much open, but we can go back and forth to Mexico. There's other people in other countries that they can't even leave their own state, or now they're just getting to the point where they're leaving they're able to leave their state and hopefully some people are like going returning back to their own country so the difference between the united states is we just always had more wiggle room that's the big difference between two years ago because two years ago when it happened everything shut down and everyone just stayed home and that was it and it built up a, 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 a growing need to travel now we can travel it's just you're limited to where you can go yeah that's um it's like in never before in history, you can say like that, that period, I remember when it first started, I thought it was going to be like, uh, like six months, huh? a year, yeah. it's going to be done. Huh? Yeah. Me, but, I didn't even think, man. I thought it was going to be like every other virus that goes through the, the world. At times, like, oh, in a few weeks, it'll be over with for people to forget about it. So I was ready to fly out of the country and it's like, we're canceling all your flights. I say, like, well, this must be serious. And then all of a sudden the city shut down. I said, this is very serious. Okay. Oh. So, yeah. And well, maybe well, you can think or think you can think um, social media because this is like the first time from previous viruses where everybody has the information. Well, most most people, and also they can share their thoughts as well. So that that's kind of like a, you're always seeking the the most uh, accurate information, and it's like a war of information. You know, it's the first time that I that I. I've ever noticed. Yeah, it, of, it's of different. Virus. Like I say, there's like most people, I feel like some people's attention span was very short when I've seen them in the past. It's just like people were cognitive of it. Uh, I forget, was it Zika? When it, when the Zika thing happened a few years ago, people knew about it and they're like, okay, I'll be apprehensive. They were kind of like uh, going to the Caribbean and Central America had worried them, but it went away after a few months. Zika's still around, but it kind of went away. This has been persistent and everyone's just like, and I also have to kind of blame the fact that everyone's home all the time. They're just digesting so much information at all times. And everyone feels as though they're an expert, but it also like kind of generated a, a sort of fear. So I understand when my clients come to me and say, well, I want to go somewhere, but I don't want to go anytime soon. I want to wait until things kind of settle down. Understood. I want everyone to feel comfortable no matter where they, where they go. So that's why I'm always happy to give people information because not only can I give them information, I can get them a little bit ready, like kind of prime them to visit someplace they may not have been thinking about at all. So you know, trying to use this time to, you know, like I said, build my own knowledge as well as get people ready for other destinations that they may have looked, looked at before when this is all over with. And hopefully it's over with very soon. Yes, hopefully it is. And um, uh, that's, that's kind of a good strategy, you know? That's something that you should prepare tourists with that. Um, how do you say it? Yeah, like excitement of traveling again. And I wanted to ask you, what, uh, what do you think are your perspectives for tourism um, in Philadelphia and for the services that you provide uh, by this 2022? You gave me a little, a little bit of uh, your explanation, but maybe you could go a little bit in detail. And also uh, for 2025, if you can notice that far ahead. I think the next 20, no, this year, 2022 is going to be kind of a tenacious year. Like many cities in the United States, it's almost a ghost town. There's places that I'm not used to being almost empty or desolate. It's it's sort of empty and desolate right now. So I can't really pro 
forecast what's going to happen this year. I think it's just going to be a strange year for everyone. I think once the summer comes around, people are going to like move around a little bit more because it's, well, it's summertime. I'm really looking at 20, really 2025. That's when things start to like actually slowly moving back to, to uh, people traveling around. And that's going to be people that really travel. Like they travel maybe four plus times a year. It's probably going to take like 10 years before we get back to 2019 numbers because after all this is over with, it's going to be a slow rebuild. It's going to be gaining trust again. It's, we've lost a number of low cost air carriers uh, over the last two years. It's going to be those options that we, did, that we had before, we no longer have. So cost is going to be a factor. Trust is going to be a factor. You know, education is going to be a factor. People knowing that these places are open and hopefully the restrictions are gone. So we have a long, long road ahead of us and a lot of uh, hurdles to get through. So it's going to rely on people like yourself to get us there. Well, hopefully we can collaborate, do something and change yeah. something, you know, like just uh, at least um, get the word out of what can be done. But um, I'm curious to ask what, it, since this two period, this two year period, you said you noticed differences as well um, in the industry. What do you think are the main trends, the shift in trends with the tourists themselves? Uh, what, are, what are they doing now differently than what they did uh, before 2019? You recall? The, the biggest trend, and I know for a lot of your, your listeners and viewers, they are going to say, oh, oh yeah, that, from everything, is looking at the United States as a real tour, tourist destination. And I think this is happening all over the world. People looking at their own country and say, huh, you know what? I never explored this place before. Let me check, let me check that out. Let me see what's there. I know a number of people that when they say vacation, they're not thinking of any place in the United States. It's like, I have to leave the country. I have to go somewhere else. But now people are looking and saying like, huh, Montana, what's in Montana? Let me go there. Or, huh, let me go to, uh, you know, let me, let me go back to uh, the New Orleans. I haven't been there for a while. Let me rediscover what's changed since then. So I see people like re-exploring, going to like New England, you know, trying to the food there. So that's the biggest trend I've seen is like people really exploring the, 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 the spaces around them. I noticed a lot of tourism in Philadelphia about with Maryland, like, hey, come to, come to Maryland, see what's there, come back to Baltimore, come check it out. But <clears throat> that's the biggest trend. What else? Hmm. Trend, can't think of anything else. Hmm. No, and that's a, that's a really good point that you made. A lot of domestic tourism is happening in different countries as well. Like in Mexico, I've heard a lot of people, instead of seeking um, even their own, getting out of state, they prefer to go in-state, huh? just to travel inside, let's say Nayarit or inside Jalisco. And that's an interesting shift as well, which is good, you know, for the economy as well. Yeah, I know last time I was in Mexico, I was in uh, Veracruz and they were like tourism, tourists coming to like the border to Oaxaca. And I said, oh, it's like, it was like, well, we have some tourists that come through and that, that's a new thing for us, like getting tourists to like, I'm sorry, not Veracruz, it was um, Guerrero, Guerrero, it was Guerrero. So they were like, oh yeah, we, ne we typically don't get people from inside the country, the interior, there are people coming from um, the capital that were just visiting various places. Cause like you just said, they just, they, they want to see more Mexico. They know, they realize out of 32 states, they haven't really been to much, many of them. So now's the time to explore. So I'm very appreciative of that because like I say, if you want to learn about other cultures, you should learn about your own culture first and learn about the differences in it. So that's a good thing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's important to understand at least your history, you know, where, where you come from and domestic tourism helps. Um, do you see any, uh, in Philadelphia, I'm curious to ask, do you see any... Um, how do you say it, um, actions that the city is, is or the state is also providing to uh, prepare for this new way, new, new style of tourism? Are they doing any like, measures or new types of tourism, maybe virtual tourism or anything like that? I'll, I'll tell you the Philly's biggest issue. Philly's biggest issue is New York and D.C., now, nothing personal is like, because we're sandwiched, it's like 90 minutes if you're riding the Metro or Amtrak, 90 minutes to get into the city. When I say the city, I mean Manhattan and 90 minutes to go to DC. So it, our issue has always been, people really look at Philly and say, okay, Liberty Bell and Rocky, that's it. I can see that in a half hour. So the tourism, our, our tourism uh, agency has always been, uh, not my tourism, but the, 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 the city itself, it's always been about helping to distinguish ourselves from those two 
metropolises, which probably imagine is very, very difficult. So we've had a number of campaigns over the years. And <clears throat> something I was hoping after after uh, last year is that we can help cop capitalize on the fact that uh, our previous president always stated bad things happen in Philly. And I was hoping that the tourism board would like use that and say, mm, print out some shirts, you know, people, because in the past it's Philly has been more like, Philly's for families, come to Philly. It's great for your family. You know, it's everyone's saying that. It's like, now we had some like, hey, you know, bad hombres, bad things happen in Philly. Come to Philadelphia, find out why bad things happen in Philly. You know, it's not, it's not scary. Come, come to Philadelphia, learn about us. We haven't really capitalized on that. It seems like we're more in limbo. You know, like I said, like it's it, we're, we're we're seeing travelers, people that are traveling throughout the United States, but it's like right now, it's just it's very quiet. Uh, end of the summertime is more, but I think people are in a, also getting a little like they want more options. They want to they want to start moving outside the country because now it's like it's two years in, and it took about like six or seven months before people start traveling around the United States. So there's a little bit of. Now I kind of want to see what else is out there. I love, I've explored a lot. I can see a few more places in the United States, but when I, I want to I wanna explore some, some other countries as well. But as, let me go back a little bit as far as Philadelphia. I don't know what they're doing as far as tourism. I think they're missing out on an opportunity to educate people and really get people to know about, about the city by coming out with a new tourism uh, campaign. But right now it's question marks, question marks. I wish I knew what was going on, but really it's just like, it's question marks. Yeah, and it's, uh, you know, because I asked you that question because every state prepares their own um, way of doing tourism, you know? So I was just curious to see if they were like coming up with new plans, <coughs> new ideas, but maybe that's for another video, you know? Maybe um, like everyone's in a wait and see mode and they want to see what happens, but we it's just been, it's been quiet. I haven't heard anything. I haven't seen any new campaigns in some time. So I'm just, I'm waiting. Yeah, maybe they don't want to do that because they don't want to uh, bring people in, you know. Maybe they want to still preserve the the spread of, of COVID. You know, I, I understand as well. Huh? Like I, said, I, like, I remember, I, mean, I think I saw, like, tourism to other states. I think I saw a little bit of tourism, like, Penn Station, about trying to get people to Philadelphia that live in New York. And that succeeded. I, I volunteer in a number of landmarks and stuff around the city. And I would often ask, like, where are you from? Where are you visiting? And it was a lot of Oh, we're from New York. We're visiting because we want to see what's actually down here. So I think there was some tourism to other states. Yeah, I, saw, I, mean, I think I saw it, while I was in New York, there's a lot of, hey, come to upstate New York. Or, hey, New York has beaches. Did you know that New York's a big state? And I saw like in Maryland, it was like, hey, come to Philadelphia. So I think the tourism was more going off the, 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 the connected states. But I haven't seen that. Once again, I have not seen that in months. Uh, I so said, I know the city and I know everyone in the city wants to bring some type of tourism to them, bring some type of money in. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we lost a number of restaurants and businesses because of like the protests last year and because of COVID itself. So yeah, I think like pockets are getting a little thin. They want to like keep things, think, keep things going. But right now I said nothing new, no real tourism uh, campaign happening. So it's kind of quiet. But I do see people visiting the city, which is a good thing, which I've never seen before. People are coming in winter. Usually at this period, it's absolutely quiet. Now people are sort of visiting during the winter because, like I said, I think they're just tired of being stuck at home and they want more options. So now they're like working down the list and Philadelphia is part of the list. And I'm sure Oregon is on the list as well. What have you seen out there in your neck of the woods? Yeah, well, it's here during this period, like a year. I did notice a lot of people visiting and also staying here, like a lot of people from California, from Texas, uh, starting to buy homes in this market. And I saw, I saw a lot of people complaining about how the prices went up. So that's an indicator that Oregon is one of those states that hasn't been uh, on the eyesight of a lot of people until now. So that's interesting as well. I've seen a lot of uh, travel in this part of Central Oregon, but in Portland, it has had a, like a, how do you say it, a negative effect because they had protests as well. I'm sure you're aware of that. And then um, that caused a lot of uh, homeless people to get into the downtown area and then a lot of disorder, a lot of chaos, which also did, doesn't allow for like uh, a good image, you know, for travel. So other, other parts of Oregon are, are now um, 
the on the spotlight, you know, which is good, you know. But uh, I can see now the problems of tourism, <laughs> which is like they they the people have visited for a long time, and now they like it so much that they stay here, and then that causes issues with the locals who see that everything is a little bit more fast paced, everything is, the prices get higher, you know, um, opportunities maybe of labor, which right now are, are not an issue because there's work for everybody. But I can see how the locals um, are resisting, you know, to, too much tourism. So that's another shift that I think it's interesting to see and also to consider for our future states or future destinations. So they keep a balance, you know, keep a balance. But can the state survive without tourism? I know a number of countries they they stayed locked down. They stayed, they kept their restrictions up because they pretty much said we don't need tourism, so we're fine. We can go without. Can Oregon survive without tourism? Ah, uh, that's a good question. You know, um, 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 the thing is, I've been here like two years. Uh, I haven't been that involved with uh, the the tourism information centers, but. Oregon does depend a lot on tourism. I can see it, it, it brings a lot of uh, foreign people with events and all of that nature. So completely restricted of tourism, I think it will see the impact, but it also has other industries that can like aviation, lumber, all of that, that can kind of mitigate for a while. <coughs> But that's kind of the, tur the problem with tourism, you know, it's, it's a complex industry, it involves a lot. And then when uh, things go sideways, then it, 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 it's the first one to be affected, you know, especially when it's biological, it's a, it's a biological issue. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you a last question, brother. Um, what, what um, this is a question that I usually ask everybody that I interview. Um, there, you know, when you first start out, when you're like 18, 19, you don't really know much of what you want to do, like in, fu in the future, or your future career or your path. And also want to ask people, like, what is their tip of advice for somebody that is in that age and that wants to see which one is the correct option, if it exists, you know, if there exists, like what, well, for example, for tourism, what kind of characteristics does that have? Does that person have to have in order to thrive in the industry? What kind of uh, abilities has to they have to develop, or they have to have innately to be successful in tourism? Which I think is a pretty good guide, so that they can find something else in case they don't like the industry. You know? What do you think is your tips of advice? Funny, I answered a similar question to my goddaughter in, uh, in, in Santiago de Chile. So she's about like 17, 18 right now. So she has to make, she's feeling the pressure of parents saying, okay, you have to decide what you're going to do with the rest of your life. <coughs> and I told her to relax. And it's the advice I have for everyone. Number one, relax. I know you're scared. I know you're uncomfortable, but you're young. And whatever profession you go in, it may not be the profession you stay in for like for the rest of your life. This is not the 40s or 50s when your father or mother worked at one job and they stayed there for the rest of their life and they retired and had a pension. Things are different now. Some people work at multiple companies in different trade. So the first thing is relax. Number two, try to figure out exactly what you enjoy doing, what you can see yourself just doing for the rest of your life and say, this is not work. This is fun. Now, make a list. Try it out. See if you can actually do it as a profession. So what I'm saying is explore. See what's available. You know, if you bounce from place to place, that's fine. As long as you're putting money in your pocket for the time being where you can like, you know, afford the things you need in life. And most importantly, save your money. <laughs> and I say this kids all, save your money and learn about how you can make your money work for you. That's fine. You will find wherever profession you are, whatever profession you want, if you just take the time into learning what's available for you and what, what you gravitate to. So that'd be the first step, just going out there, you know, writing that list and just exploring. Some people, right off the bat, they, 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 they gravitate to what they want or they have an idea of what they want fairly young and they stick with it and it's like gangbusters. Rest of their life, they're good with it. <clears throat> but I wasn't one of those people. Obviously, if you've been listening to what I've been saying for the last what 40 minutes, you know, obviously, I was in advertising. I started in photography. 
slowly gravitated to advertising, to art direction, yeah. then the marketing. And then at what, like 28, 30, I said, I don't want to do this anymore. Traveled the world for four years, bounced around from place to place, and eventually kind of turned back around and said, you know what? This is what I want to do. So this is my second life that I'm living right now. So I use that example. This is my second life. I didn't have all the answers. I was scared when I was in school. My parents, I'm a first generation in the United States. And my parents wanted what every parent of a, every, every family of first generation kid wanted. They want you to be a lawyer. <laughs> they want you to be a doctor. They want you to be an engineer. They want you to have those jobs. And I looked at it and I said, I don't want those jobs. I'm not interested in those jobs. So that's, once again, I go back, number one, relax, calm down. I know your parents are going to put pressure on you, but try to relax and think your way through and start thinking about things and jobs that would make you happy. So that's, once again, I go back to that, you know, starting with that list and just exploring and trying to figure out which one works for you. As far as the traits or the skills needed, tenacity, learning. If you enjoy what you're doing, you're going to always learn about, I enjoy what I'm doing. I'm all, I know I always sound pessimistic. I always worry about you. He's like, God, this guy is always pessimistic. Why is he so negative? He's like, no, I'm a, I'm a, I was born an inner old man. I was looking, when I, when I got my first gray hair, I was happy. I was like, yes, finally, I can be an old man. That's what I've always wanted to be. That's the profession I want, old man that drinks tea all day and complains. But I love what I do. I'm always learning. I'm always like gravitating, getting more information. So that's what you need for any type of job, learning more about it, staying on top of it. Because in my job and with any job, it's knowledge, it's information. People eventually become comfortable with what what I offer them and what I, the advice I give them because they can see like, oh, he knows what he's talking about, number one. Number two, I'm passionate. I have my moments where I'm just like, I'm passionate when I'm talking to people about history, when I'm talking to people about destinations, when I'm explaining like, this is what Mexico is. This is what the country's like. <clears throat> you know, this is what Hungary is. I'm passionate. I'm drawing a picture in their head. I'm not a person that simply, I want to go places because I like to travel. That's fine. But I'm telling you, I want you to go to these places because I want you to learn about it and I want you to form a personal connection so I can draw a picture for them. Because once again, it's passion. So if every profession, there has to be passion about it. You have to be willing to learn more about it. You just can't do the surface level work. You have to do the deep dive. So that would be the second component to it. Once again, I apologize. I, I ramble at times. No, you're good. You're good, man. You're good. <laughs> That's the point, you know, like to give in detail um, um, experience that you have that you can pass on to like the youth, you know, because um, it's an interesting time right now with uh, the shift in technology as well. Yeah. A lot of uh, confusion, I can see a lot of confusion like in the society as, as a whole. And also giving some advice from somebody who has lived the, the, the life a little bit longer, they, they can give you like shortcuts or like hints, you know, of what, what and what not to do. So I really appreciate those. Um, okay, Keshe, so I think I really, uh, really appreciate you uh, having this chat with me. It's a, it's a pleasure for you. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, how, how can uh, people reach out to you? Like if they want to like, you know, about your services, give, ask you information, where can they contact you? Do you know? Yeah, me, social media, Lake Canard Tourism. Uh, dot com that's my website. I also have a, a blog that I stopped writing for two years, but now I'm back. I write about 500 words every day. So that's why I'm usually up throughout the night. Nighttime is the golden hour. I'm always writing. So I'm back to like posting destinations on the blog. And I'm finally coming into my own uh, voice as far as like that, that writing style. So I say go to my blog, you know, if you want to get an idea of like what my experience are like, the Lake Canard Tourism website, uh, social media, I'm on, um, I'm on Instagram. Whereas on Instagram, I break down destinations. Sometimes I break like a big deep dive. Then for the net, for this month, I'm focusing on foods, foods that you can only find in specific parts of the world. And today I post the uh, Azores, uh, Azores Islands off of Portugal, the seafood, the pineapples, so good. But yeah, it's like the whole month, I'm just focused on foods that you can only find from specific uh, Pozzoli. I think that's later in the month, like places from, you have to go to these places to eat that food. Or, so uh, Instagram, if you're in that target, uh, target audience, Instagram would be a good place to reach out to me and Facebook as well. An older crowd where I have different information. So I'm always putting different things out there at all times. So sometimes it's hard for me to keep track of it. But you can find me on all types of social media. Lake Canard Tourism. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, no TikTok? 
<laughs> not yet, man. I, I can't do all the videos. It was just me sitting around drinking by myself and complaining. I don't think anybody wants to see that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna keep people away from that. I'm gonna wait until I get a little bit older, and then I'm just gonna see me just complaining and talking about you know whatever pops up in my head. You could do that and with like a glass of whiskey and some jazz music yeah. in the background, you know, and, and make it a 60 second video and you'd be, you'd be a hit, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Scene from a bar. It's just me and various bars drinking whiskey and complaining about things. Like, ah. Like in, a, in, like in an old man fashion, you know? Uh, that would be yeah. pretty good. That would be pretty, I'll, I'll watch that, you know? <laughs> like, like history from a drunk. <laughs> do you know? Oh, El Barocha. Um, El Barocho. Yeah, it'd be like El Barocho, yeah. <laughs> Borracho Cashler and uh, yeah, a or something, yeah. you know, something yeah. like that, you know, chat with yeah. Cashler or something. I don't know, it's anything can happen, you know. <laughs> yeah. So okay, so, so like, social so media much. and then LinkedIn and uh, Instagram as Le, Le, Le Canard Tourism, right? Yes, and Le Canard. I know people kind of look and say, "What does that mean, Le Canard?" Uh, Le Canard. It means actually two things. Uh, one, it's the bird, the duck, <clears throat> but Le Canard also means something that is untrue. And that's the one I kind of gravitate to. So when people say like Le Canard, what is that? Le Canard. And the tourism just to reinforce it's travel tourism. But when people say, well, I can't go someplace. I, I, I really can't. I only have time for this. I realize like that's what Le Canard means. Something that is untrue. If that is untrue that you can't make time to travel. It is untrue that you can't make time to learn something about a culture. And I hear that often. I don't have time. I need time for my vacation, you know, to relax. It is untrue you can't spare at least like 20 minutes or an hour to learn something about a different culture. So I lean that that's what Lake Canard means. That's the that's the the, the logo, maybe the, the 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 bird, but it's it's untrue. You can learn something. It's untrue. You do deserve a vacation, you do deserve that time. Get out there. Lake Canard tourism. And I'm here to help you do that. So let's sit down, let me learn about what you want to do when you travel, and let's create an itinerary itinerary that's based around your preferences, not just the package that I found. I can do that, but let's create a trip that's based around what you enjoy doing, what you want to see, and how your experience should turn out for you. So that's what Lake Canard means. Okay, so the, I was, was going to ask you that, but somehow I just slipped out of my, my brain. Huh? <laughs> but I really appreciate you uh, explaining that. Um, Keshler, it was, a, it was a pleasure. Hopefully this is not the last time we chat. We can do another video, video calls. And, Hopefully this uh, is a good experience. You, know, you invite me on again, this time from a bar. Next time. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Huh? <laughs> it was a pleasure, man. Take care. And uh, you too. Uh, thank Take you guys for watching as well for the video. Hope you like it. And um, we'll see you on the next, next video.